again, there's no in the F-14. You got a Rio with a radar in the back, um, so there's no pilot to bail you out if you goon something up in the front seat. And so I want to say the first couple flights, you know, they do put a pilot in the back. And, you know, kind of to walk you through whatever the syllabus is and getting used to the airplane. But then after that, it's a uh, it's a Rio who's one of the instructors sitting in the back. And, you know, those guys are wealth of knowledge. They've been to the fleet. They've been out there on a cruiser, too. And they certainly earn their pay dealing with what they had to sit through sometimes, you know, with a new pilot up front. And no stick to really bail them out. You can only talk to them. And... Uh, one of the lead safes was an F-14 guy, and so we came back, and he brought us back, and, you know, that was great, and you celebrated at the club that night, and he said, okay, so if you end up F-14s, you've got to remember, never get behind on that thing, because it was a turbofan TF-30 engine, which was kind of new, and this is the A model, I only flew the A model, and so if you ever let them spool back, you know, you're going to... You're going to have a hard time getting them back powered up. And that that was always the greatest concern behind the boat with a, with one of the F-14s. If guys got high or if they got fast, they make a huge correction by bringing the throttles back to idle and they don't catch it, you know. And and I was an LSO in, in, in my fighter squadron. And so you would watch the the black smoke coming out the back as the guy is, is you know, making the corrections. And, man, if that smoke disappeared – you knew, and of course, seeing, of course, you're hearing them also that it's back on the power. Is you, you know, you want to make a call to get that power back on. Um, and and the other thing too about the F-14, it had that huge swing wing, big wing span. It had a tendency to glide a little bit. You know, it could have used a little more drag. The speed brake was between the two vertical tails. It could be a little bit more draggy in that. And there was also one down below, I think, on the underside. Um, but in that airplane, again, it had a slower approach speed. The wing loading, I think, was a little bit less, so it got bounced around a little bit more. Yeah, it 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 could be, if you got behind it a little bit, it could be a handful and not as stable as like an F4 or an A4 behind the boat. Um, but so those were kind of things to watch for flying it. So and And, you know, during our training, that was always brought out and uh, something to look at. And, you know, you end up going to the F-14 training squadron, you're doing the same thing. I mean, we did a ton of FCLPs. Now, training command, it's daylight only, right? You don't go out there at night. They wait until you end up going to the fleet squadron, the fleet training squadron, before they take you to the boat at night. And that's a whole different experience, as you can imagine, compared to what daylight will look like. Yeah, no, no NVGs. I mean, night is yeah. tough even with NVGs, uh, but you obviously can't land with NVGs. So even still, it's interesting that you don't do that in a in a training squadron. I mean, I know the fleet, I guess the FTR, the we call fleet training placement squadron, a little bit different than the Air Force, but right. Uh, that that's where you're getting your follow on, top off training. Right, right. So you know, you ended up a couple other things, which so was kind of unusual for my TA four trying to wrap that up. So the boat, you were kind of always, if the boat was available, that took priority. So no matter where you were in your syllabus, except for, the, of course, the very beginning portion, but I'm sure there was, I forget exactly how many hours or whatever you would have needed, but hey, if the boat's available, we're discontinuing all the other training, we're going to take you, warm you up, and then take you out to the boat because, yeah. you know, it's just going to be out there in the Gulf. And for me, that kind of occurred before the ACM finished up, and so... I'm supposed to get my wings on this one specific day, and but I still got a hop to do. I still got to do an ACM ride in order to get my wings, and the weather's not too good. So what they did was they put a surgrad, which is like a fape in the Air Force. So these are the guys that get their wings, but they retain them in terms of staying on and being instructors. So yeah, one of the great guys, one of the, the great Sir grads, you know, in the squad and gets in the back and, and we go out and fly the hop, which basically was, I think we could have taken off. And if I did one hard turn, they probably would have completed it. I <laughs> called it good. You know? right. And then come back and do a GCA, which was a thing we don't, you know, the Navy doesn't have ILS. You know, trainers is all ground controlling guy. And so that's, that's kind of a different way to come, you know, to, to land through the goo. So ended up checking the block, come back in, get the GCA, pull back into the chocks. And I think it took an hour to go change, take a shower, put on my 
you know, dress uniform and, and I'm in my winging ceremony within, you know, an hour and a half after landing, that kind of thing. So I remember that. That was kind of a big day and <laughs> a big blur, you know, to say the least. Yeah. So off to the F-124 I go, the F-14 RAG or FRS as we, uh, however you want to call it. And so there it was like learning to fly the F-14. Now, again, there's no in the F-14, you got a Rio with a radar in the back, so there's no pilot to bail you out if you goon something up in the front seat. And so I want to say the first couple flights, you know, they do put a pilot in the back and, you know, kind of to walk you through whatever the syllabus is and getting used to the airplane. But then after that, it's a, uh, it's a Rio who's one of the instructors sitting in the back and you know, those guys are wealth of knowledge. They've been to the fleet. They've been out there on a cruise or two. And they certainly earn their pay dealing with what they had to sit through sometimes, you know, with a new pilot up front. And no stick to really bail them out. You can only talk to them. And, you know, even as a Rio, there's some things you just don't know about up front, flying an airplane or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, a typical two-ship flight, you've got in the lead, it's the instructor pilot with a student Rio. And then dash two, it's a student pilot with an instructor Rio in the back. And that's usually the way, you know, everything was, was played out when you had a two plane formation. So it's interesting. Our 15 schoolhouse, I think right now is in the process of merging where you're having for this official term, right? But you, you used to have a F 15 C schoolhouse, all single seat mentality, F 15 E schoolhouse, which was, you know, is the strike Eagle with a wizard. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. now we have the EX version come online, which is going to be this hybrid of sometimes single pilot, sometimes with a WISO complement. And now they're going through this, this merging process of a combined syllabi, or however we want to phrase it, where you're going to have C model, E model, and EX model all coming together as they, they sort through that. That, you know, again, my, my experience in F-16, it makes it super easy when you're just the mayor of Cockpit City and not having to... <laughs> You know, yeah, it, you know, it would be, it would sometimes it'd be nice to have someone back there helping out other times. Yeah. Like, well, it's on me. You know, and, and of course I, I, I never flew in combat, but you know, at the time you had some Vietnam experience people in the senior levels and man, that extra set of eyeballs, you know, was, was always appreciated, um, in, in a conflict in the, uh, you know, in an air combat arena. So, and those guys, you know, there's some guys that are really good and they learn to kind of fly the airplane. And, and you can imagine your first BFM ride, you know, with a new student up front, you know, trying to talk eyes on to the, you know, the, the, the bandit or whatever and all the other things that go through in maneuvering the airplane. Um, and just riding along, if he gets high, you know, high alpha, high AOA, slow airspeed and the thing departs, you know, yeah, it was I think they, they knew where the ejection seat handle was at all times if if yeah. needed. But did, yeah. Did you ever depart in F fourteen? I think so. <laughs> I think I did. No, I you know that I airplane saw the top gun. Yeah. I no, I, nothing like that, thank goodness. You always okay, so the engines were always a thing to be kind of concerned about. TF thirties, they weren't bulletproof. And you know, if you got slow and you stalled one and the other one's in full blower you could see we had asymmetric thrust and that could get away from you, you know, whatever. Um, I do remember cross controlling the airplane and using a lot of rudder at times, you know, but as long as you were cognizant of what, where the alpha was, you know, it, it seemed to be okay. And, and, but you know, you're always kind of a little tentative. It wasn't like with the digital flight control system and the F-16, like we, we know you're asking it for whatever you want and it'll give you what it can. This, the F-14, there wasn't, you know, any fly-by-wire in there for the most part. There was some augmentation that would help out for stability. 